Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Are you persistent in prayer or do you grow weary? I was pondering this question prompted by the gospel reading for today as I was preparing for the sermon. And I have to say my answer to that question was pretty uncomfortable and disappointing to me. Because as I examine my own prayer life, I can't in any honesty say I pray always and that I don't grow weary. Because the truth is, I do. And I think many of you, if you ask yourselves that question as well, come to the same conclusion. How often have you started a prayer about something really long term, even for yourself or someone else, and after a few days? It's forgotten. Or how many times, like me, have you found yourself in a difficult situation and you don't realize until you've tried four or five other things that you didn't even pray to begin with? It's a humbling realization. After all, one of the great gifts that God has given us through His Son, Jesus, is a direct line of communication to the God of the universe. And if there's anybody that you should talk to about difficult things should be Him, and yet we rely on our reasoning and our own effort and our own abilities to try and accomplish many things that we need the help of God for. Well, as I was also reading this text, I was reminded of another thing that I have experienced. I was at a family ministry conference a couple of years ago, and there was a really interesting presentation. It was a presentation given by a son and both of his parents. And the story of the presentation may be one that some of you are familiar with or know of or unfortunately may have experienced yourselves. It was the story of a son, a child, who grew up and went away from home and became lost, became a prodigal, dropped out of dental school, and his story is about as extreme as you can get in this particular struggle. He ended up becoming a homosexual very aggressively and openly. He stopped speaking at all with his parents or communicating with them, never, never went to see them, and eventually got into drugs, began trading in drugs, and all of this continued until the police knocked on his door and he ended up in jail. And when he was in jail, all that stuff gone scared, who did he call? His parents, for the first time in many, many years. God, in His great mercy, gathered this prodigal son back to Himself. He was, after all, presenting at a Christian conference, and now He teaches at Moody Bible Institute, and He went and studied to be a pastor. But it wasn't his story that really stood out to me. It was the story from his mother's perspective. So I gave you a short summary of the story of this son from the time he dropped out of school until he was gathered back to Jesus. But that was a period of many years, many years with no contact with parents. Parents had no idea where he was, what he was up to in his life, afraid for him. And during all that time, his mother prayed for him nearly daily. For whatever reason, that hit me really hard. She prayed continually, even though her son never spoke to her, never returned their phone calls, and she had no idea where he was and what he was doing. And the Lord answered her prayer. And I remember in the presentation, there was one point where the husband mentioned of his wife's prayer that it shifted. See, when she started out, she was praying to God, but she wanted the solving of this problem to be on terms that she wanted. And eventually, she relinquished that and started praying, however you wish to do it, Lord, restore my son, which is a dangerous prayer because the Lord works in mysterious ways. I don't imagine she thought the answer to her prayer would be a call from jail for her son. But so it was. 
Now, if you're like me listening to a story like that, they get to the end and you've got to be like, wow, how do I even begin to do that? To pray so faithfully for so many years with very little encouragement in return about the situation for which I'm praying, that takes devotion and love. And it takes faith, the sort of faith that really believes that God is listening and the sort of faith that really believes He can actually do something about this issue. Well, dear friends in Christ, this is what Jesus is talking about today in our gospel reading. It is an encouragement to us, His disciples, to persist in our prayer. Do not grow weary. In fact, Luke wants to make this so clear, he tells us before the parable even begins why Jesus is saying it. He says to him, and he said a parable to them to show that they must always pray and not grow weary. And I'll note that here, always pray doesn't mean that you don't do anything else except pray all day. It means regularly and devotedly to pray. So why is Jesus encouraging His disciples to pray in this manner? This encouragement comes from Jesus just after He has spoken in chapter 17 of a a bunch of different kinds of days. And He uses the word day to mark three main different time periods, and here's what they are. So one is called the days of the Son of Man, And those are the days right then, the current days where Jesus is speaking, when He is walking the earth, doing His earthly ministry on His way to the cross and the empty tomb. So basically, from His birth at Christmas to His ascension at the end of Easter. The next set is the days that will come. And this is the days of the church where we live now from the ascension of Christ, and this this time period won't end until He returns. And then the last day is that day, the day that Jesus returns, Judgment Day. And as He's telling them of these different days, He's talking to them about the days that will come, the days of the church, which they're about to embark on after Jesus accomplishes all that He sets out to do in Jerusalem. And He tells them that in those days you will wish for the days of the Son of Man. In other words, they're going to wish that they were back where Jesus was right there walking on the road with them. And he says that because he knows that they're going to endure hardship. Hardship similar to the story that I shared with you and many others. Many others that you yourselves experience. So in other words, Jesus is offering this encouragement and gives this example because His disciples are about to enter a time of trial and tribulation, the time of the church, the time that we live in now. So the story I shared is one example, and it may be an example that you can personally resonate with. Hopefully not to the extreme of that particular example, but I know that there are many in every church whose children have lost their way who are disconnected from God, who have departed the faith that they were taught and raised up in. And that's a trial and a difficulty and a pain. Do not grow weary in your prayer for their return, for your Lord hears you. Maybe you endure chronic bodily pain like Paul, a thorn in the flesh, and it threatens to discourage you. It threatens to get you to believe that God isn't really listening, He isn't really merciful, otherwise He would take it away. Do not grow weary and continue your prayers. Maybe you just feel overwhelmed by the negative forces at work in our world that seem so daunting, that the development of things in our culture or across the globe just make you want to throw up your hands in despair and give up. Do not grow weary. Be persistent in your prayer. Today, Jesus is encouraging you to pray always. Don't grow weary 
Now, that encouragement sounds a bit empty just stated by itself, but there's a really strong foundational basis for why he can say that, and it actually means something. The first is that just as he has come, the days of the Son of Man, he really came to earth and accomplished the full work of salvation on the cross and the empty tomb, you can believe that person, Jesus, is faithful to his promises. For he went to death on a cross for you in order to buy your salvation with his very body body and blood. He's promised to return, he keeps his promises. And two, but God will not make vindication of his but will not God make vindication of his elect who are crying to him day and night and be long suffering to them. He has chosen you as his own. Granted you the gift of faith through the Holy Spirit, called by his word, enlightened by his gifts. He's promised to take care of all of your needs. And he loves you and gave up everything for your salvation. He hears your prayers. Now, this brings us to the parable itself. And Jesus gives this parable to demonstrate something that His audience would be aware of or know about or maybe themselves have observed to illustrate a truth about our relationship with God. So, in the parable, there's a widow that she's seeking vindication or justification from her opponent. And the fact that she's a widow is not insignificant. See, in the ancient world, a widow is extremely helpless. Without a man to speak on her behalf within the courts, she has no recourse for justice for wrongdoings that have been committed against her. And so she only has one option, to appeal to the judge, to turn the heart of the judge. So in this example, the widow is totally helpless and the judge has all of the power, all the cards. And then here's what's said of the judge, that the judge neither fears God nor respects man. What exactly does that mean? Well, by saying that he doesn't fear God, that's like the definition of faith in the Old Testament, the beginning of all wisdom, Luke is telling us that this judge is not a believer in God, he's a pagan. And then secondly, that he doesn't respect men, it means that he has no lack of shame. He's not compelled by the obligations of society to care for anyone other than himself. And the reason Jesus highlights these two things is those would be the two reasons in this situation that his hearers would understand that the judge would have a responsibility to the widow. Either based on the faith in God and God commands that you take care of the orphan and the widowed among you, or just out of shame for violating the social obligations that he has from other people. So this judge has none of that. No reason to help the helpless widow. And yet, a strange thing occurs. These two extremes are represented by pure power and pure helplessness, and yet the helpless triumphs through persistence. Even in this hopeless example that Jesus gives, the persistence of the widow doesn't really change the heart of the judge, but for his own sake, he decides to grant her justice so she would leave him alone. The Greek there is that he was afraid that she would give him a black eye. It doesn't mean that she's going to walk up and punch him in the face. It means a metaphorical black eye on his reputation. So it turns out he seems to care a little bit about what other people think. But the purpose of that extreme example is to illustrate that if that is true, how much more will a God who is a righteous judge, full of grace and mercy, hear those who cry to Him? If even in this terrible situation with an unrighteous judge and someone totally helpless that her prayers are granted, how much more should our prayers be granted for those who call on the help of God? And Jesus points to this fact Himself when He says, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And here's what the unrighteous judge says. 
Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And that beat me down part, that's the black eye. So just for that sake, he's going to grant her justification, her vindication from her opponent. And Jesus is encouraging you by saying, how much more, if that is true, how much more will God hear those who cry to Him? So even in the case of an unrighteous judge, the prayer is answered, how much more with a righteous? But then He goes on and He strengthens His encouragement, not just that God hears you and will vindicate you, but that He will do so speedily. Will He delay long over them? I tell you, He will give justice to them speedily. What does that really mean here, speedily? And you might be thinking to yourself, well, pastor, you didn't choose a very good example at the beginning of your sermon because that was quite a long time. And how do I know that it's going to take even, not going to take even longer than that for my prayers? So when Jesus is talking about speedily here, He's referring specifically to His death and resurrection on the cross. He's just given His third passion prediction. He's on His way to Jerusalem for this very purpose, to vindicate the helpless, to justify the helpless. In other words, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you have been vindicated in the eyes of God through the work of Jesus. He did not delay. And notice that's specifically what the widow is requesting of the judge justify me, vindicate me from my opponent. Who's your opponent? Nothing but sin, death, and the devil. And in Christ, your vindication has been accomplished. You have been justified in the face of your opponent. If that is true, pray always and do not grow weary. So, dear friends in Christ, during this days will come time of the church, you are going to face trials and tribulations, like the example I gave you or one that has come into your head as soon as I spoke those words. Do not grow weary, for we are not faced with an unrighteous judge who neither fears God nor, nor respects man. For our judge is righteous but He also abounds in grace and mercy for the helpless, and He has vindicated you from your opponent by offering His body and blood on the cross. You have been vindicated forever. In the name of Jesus, amen.